Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, how to get the most out of your Penicam for the cataract and refractive surgery using the holiday report. The holiday interpretation guidelines can also be found in the handout section of your GoToWebinar screen. You also have a text box where you can enter questions. Feel free to enter your questions during or immediately after the presentation, and we will have some time to discuss them at the end. Our speaker tonight needs no introduction. I am sure most of you know Dr. Holliday. He is a clinical professor of ophthalmology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and has been teaching optics for over 40 years. It's an honor to have Dr. Holliday with us tonight for this webcast, and on behalf of Oculus, I would like to express our gratitude for his time and effort. I would also like to thank you all in attendance tonight for your time. Without further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Holliday. Thank you, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, and uh, it is an honor to share how to get the most out of your Penicam uh, for the cataract and refractive surgery using the Holiday Report. And the Holiday Report is something that uh, many people at Oculus have worked on with me over the past almost 15 years now. Uh, and the goal of our report is very simple. It's to facilitate the presentation of information for the busy cataract refractive surgeon to provide the highest quality of care. And as I said, many people have worked on that and I'm very proud of the display that we have because it does make it very efficient as you see when we go over this for the clinician to be able to very quickly get the information that he needs uh to take good care of his patients now the first thing that we will see is that you must have uh, a version of the holiday report of your software that's at least more recent than 1.21 revision 33 and that was done almost two years ago in january of 25 so if you don't have a version that is more recent than that, you need to contact uh, Oculus USA so that they can update and they can do that remotely so that you have the latest software so you can uh, see everything that uh, we're doing and that the reports that you have will be exactly the same as uh, I'm showing tonight. Now, one of the things that you'll see is that the display settings that we have have a uh they're fixed in other words you can't do anything to change the display and there's a reason for that the reason is that i have spent 40 years coming up with the right display with the right sensitivity and all of those things that are important to get the display just right and that when the user goes in and starts making adjustments, they mess it up basically. And that what you see is no longer what it should be. So for example, the two exams below are identical. They were sent to me. They're not only identical, they're the same exam. The one on the left was sent to me by a user. He sent the report and he says, gee, Dr. Holiday, everything that I look on there is green and it's normal. And then I said, well, yeah, you know, you're right. Everything looks green to me. And then I looked at the settings and realized they had adjusted every single one of the settings to values that made it look green. And the exact identical exam on the right is what you should see when you have the settings appropriately uh, set. And so you can adjust that. It's set that way specifically so that we talk about the same things and the sensitivity is such that when you see red, it's bad. And when you see blue and green, it's good. And everything on all of the reports is set that way. So that's why we do that. So we get the same exact thing. Now, one thing that you have to know right off the bat are these overlays. There's only five that you need to know, but let me show you what these are. The first overlay is the dashed black and white line that's a perimeter. You notice it's not a perfect circle, 
and this is the pupil margin. So when you look at the pupil, this dashed black and white line perimeter is basically the pupil margin. The second thing that you see is this white cross with the black cross in the center, and that is the pupil center. This is the middle or what we call the centroid of this perimeter. The third thing is the limbal or geometric center of the iris, and this is what we would call the geometric center of the cornea uh, and uh, or the optical center. And so this point is important for us to reference because this is actually the optical center of the cornea. The fourth is this white circle with a black dot in the middle, and that fourth one is the visual axis, or what we call vertex normal. And the difference between vertex normal, where you see the light reflex come back from the cornea, and the visual axis is less than five microns, even in the most unusual person, and it's usually right on the button. So this is the visual axis, or vertex normal. And then five, this black circle that you see here, is where the minimum uh, pachymetry occurs in the cornea. All right, so to review those, the dash black and white is the pupil margin. The white cross with the black cross in the center is the pupil center. This is the limbal center, the brackets. The vertex normal or visual axis is this white circle with the black dot. And then pachymetry minimum is the black circle. So those are the five overlays that you need to remember in order to be able to see uh, everything that we want you to see on the map. All right, now, this is the page one of the holiday report. And what you'll see is there's three panels on the top. The first panel has the demographic information that you need. It allows you to put in a description of what it is, the date of birth, the exam date, which I, what time it was taken. The center panel we'll talk about has important values for IOL calculations. And then the third panel has additional parameters that are helpful for the refractive and the cataract surgery. We'll talk about those. Then we have uh, first column, that's going to be our topography. Second column, which will be the pachymetry. And the third column will be the elevations. So that's how we display these six different uh, maps and the panels above. Now let's take a look at the middle panel there first, because that's very important to us. Now that upper middle panel that you see here is... Uh, has a number of values on it that are important to us. Now these values that you see here are number one, the equivalent K reading 65, we call it the EKR 65. Now that EKR 65 basically is the K readings that you're gonna end up using for your IOL power calculations and we'll talk about those for in a little bit. Uh, but they here, the flat one with its axis, the steep one with its axis, the mean, the average power, the astigmatism, and these values are uh, what we would say is equivalent to the total keratometry on the IOL master. It reflects not only the front surface power, but also includes the back surface power of astigmatism. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a minute because these are called equivalent K reading 65 because there's the K readings that you, you should use in the IOL calculation. But they reflect both front and back surface power and we'll tell how we put that together in just a little bit. It also has um, over here a Q value, which is normally minus 0.26 in a normal cornea, which is the shape of the cornea. But more importantly, we have the total SA, total spherical aberration. Now, most people think that the spherical aberration in Zernike's is the four zero term, but in fact, that's not true. It's the four plus the six plus the eight. In other words, there's three terms that give you total spherical aberration, and that's what we need to know, and that's what this value is right here. 
the normal in the human population is 0.27, and you use that to determine the appropriate aspheric lens to use. So this patient's 244, and aspheric lenses come in zero from BNL, minus 18 from Alcon, and minus 27 from J and J. And so you try to match these up to try to eliminate the spherical aberration in the human eye. Uh, and this is the value that gives you that. Now, the other thing is that the ratio of the back to the front radii of the cornea are about 82.2% on the normal. And we'll see that when we start seeing refractive surgery patients, that percentage changes, but that percentage allows me to determine the amount of refractive surgery that was done on the front of the cornea. And I'll show you how that works. And then the final value on there is this RMS, root mean square, higher order wavefront error over a six millimeter zone. Now I know that's a mouthful, but what that represents is the RMS value of the higher order aberration of the wavefront over a six millimeter zone of the cornea. Now this is very important because that value determines the quality of that six millimeter zone on the cornea. Now you remember the cornea is converging the ray, so it drops from six millimeters at the cornea plane to down to about 5.3 or four at the IOL plane which is where the optics are passing through uh, the intraocular lens. So this value has been determined to be the one that tells you the quality of the cornea. It's much better than looking at a simple coma term or much better than looking at an individual because it gives you the overall performance of the cornea except for sphere and cylinder. Everything else is reflected in that value. And that value in the normal population is 0 0.370 microns. So if you took 100 patients, that would be the average. Studies have shown that if it's over 0.66, people begin to complain of poor vision. Halos, glare, poor optical quality, can't read well. That's not good. And over one micron, they all complain. Here it goes gradually from about 0.66 up to one are the people that have complaints, but they're not severe. And over one, they're very severe. Everybody complains of the quality of their vision. So this value very simply gives you the quality that you need to know of how good the quality of the image that's performed, that the cornea is able to produce. And if that image is not good, well, you'll know that because this value will be the value that you need to look at. And you would say, gee, if this patient's got one micron, I'm not going to use a multifocal lens because they already have a compromise in the optics of the cornea and they wouldn't perform well. Okay, so those are all of the values that we get on this upper middle panel. Now, when we look at the upper right panel, we see that we have the pupil diameter, which because the lights are bright when we take an image on the Pentacam, that bright image ends up with a, a small pupil, so it's a photopic pupil size. It gives us the location of the pupil relative to vertex normal. It gives us the white to white relative vertex normal. And then most importantly, it gives us a where the pachymetry min is, it gives us the value, 550 here, and says that this is 0.67 millimeters temporal and 0.4 millimeters inferior to the vertex normal. Now, what we'll see is that this vertical displacement inferiorly, it's always inferior, when that's over a certain value, that it's a problem. It's actually 0.61. But uh, so we'll look at those. So the pupil's photopic, the white to white diameter is given, uh, the location uh, should never be more than 0.61 millimeters below vertex normal. We actually flag this in yellow uh, when it's above that value because it means that that's too low and it usually means keratoconus. 
Now these values down here are also helpful. This estimated pre-refractive corneal power is important because it tells you what the corneal power was before refractive surgery. Now, how do we do that? Well, it's simple. If we know the back radius of the cornea and we know that normal is 82.2%, well, I can calculate what the radius of the cornea should be. And that's what this value is. Now, plus or minus two tenths of a doctor, this is a normal cornea. They haven't had any refractive change, but that's about the tolerances that you get. The anterior chamber depth, of course, you need for IOL power calculations in the newer formulas today. And this chord mu is the distance from the center of the pupil to the visual axis. All right, so the estimated pre-refractive K, this value right here, you do that for IOL power calculations that use the double K method uh, for calculating the IOL power. And it's easy to understand that if you had somebody with a 45 diopter cornea and did a minus five LASIK and came out 40, you wouldn't want to use the 40 to size the eye. That 40 is not the right value. You want to use the 45. And that's what this value is when you don't have that. You don't have the historical method. You don't have the history of the patient. Then this value allows you to have a value that you can put into like the IOL consultant for what the pre-refractive K was, as well as the current K, like the EKR65, and that takes all of those things into account, so it calculates the right effective lens position and the right IOL power. Now, cord mu, that's the last thing down here on the bottom. Now, the normal cord mu, the distance from the center of the pupil to the visual axis is 0.2 millimeters, and when it's above 0.42, on the um, on the Pentacam, that value means that you don't want to use a multifocal lens. Patients will complain of halos and glare. Now I need to explain something here because the value for cord mu on the Pentacam using shine fluke measures the actual distance from the center of the pupil to the visual axis at the iris plane. And that value is about two tenths of a millimeter. Now, on a keratometer or at the slit lamp, when you're looking in the eye, the cornea magnifies the pupil size and it also displaces it temporally. So the center of the pupil that you see through the cornea with the slit lamp is not where it is, actually is. It's called the apparent cord mu. And the apparent cord mu is actually three tenths of a millimeter. It's about 50% more than the value that you get that's the actual measurement on the pentacam. So you have to realize that values that you get using Placido Disc, IOL Master, Keratometer, Lenstar, to, and all of those things, topography, measure the apparent displacement. So it's 0.3. And the upper limit, is 0.6. On the Pitacam, that value is 0.42 for the upper limit, and the normal is 0.2. So this is the value that you would uh, be concerned about when the value is above 0.42 on the Pitacam, that's uh, abnormal, and above that, the placement of a multifocal lens are associated with halos and glare, and that comes from studies from Argerwal and studies from, there's a Czechoslovakian article, but basically you'd want to be careful about that because the visual performance is not good. All right, so now we have six maps. The colors go from blue to red. Now, you know, I used to have arguments with Steve Kleitz all the time because he's got 31 colors and it goes from pink to magenta. Now, I can't even tell the difference between magenta and pink. It all looks the same to me. And so you can't tell. And I can tell you right now, after 40 years, I know that a clinician cannot distinguish more than 15 primary colors from blue to red. That's why we've chosen those, because you can see distinct changes on the topography. So 
column one will be topography, column two will be corneal thickness, and column three will be the elevation. Blue will be normal or better than normal, green's normal, yellow suspicious, and red is abnormal. All right, so now let's look at these columns and see what they are. Okay, so in the first column here, this upper map is uh, called the axial or sagittal map. And what it does is it actually allows you to uh, see two things. The axial power map, which is this top one, is the one that measures the radius of curvature from the center of the Earth to the surface. So the Earth is 8,000 miles in diameter, 4,000 miles to the center. So it would measure a radius on the Earth of 4,000 miles to the center, okay? And the curvature would be one over 4,000 miles. A tangential map, on the other hand, does not care where the center of the big circle is. So if you had a Mount Everest and it was a hemisphere, on the axial map, the distance would go from 4,000 miles from the center of the Earth to 4,006 miles, the height of Mount Everest, and you wouldn't even see a blip on the screen. On a tangential map, however, it would say, gee, 4,000 miles is the curvature of the Earth, and six miles is the curvature of Mount Everest if it were a hemisphere, and 4,000 to six is a big change. So the tangential map, which gives you a relative curvature as opposed to an absolute, is much more sensitive. So you see all these little broken hemimeridians because the semimeridians are irregular. Over here, it doesn't show up because it's measuring an axial radius, so it's not as big a difference. Now, this one is actually clinically more reflective of what the power changes in the cornea are, but this one geometrically is much more sensitive, so you'll see in a normal patient, these are still have regular Myers and look good. This is a patient that has pretty good Myers, but still has some irregularity, okay? And that will show up on that uh, RMS HOA error when we see it. All right, so this is the axial and that's the tangential map. Now, the next one we have is the pachymetry map. This map is absolute. It shows you the thicknesses from the center to the periphery that get thicker as we go out. This black circle is the uh, thinnest point of the cornea, and that bracket is, of course, the center of the cornea or the limbus. And this absolute map always goes from thin to thick, okay? So it always looks like a looney tune. It goes from a, a yellow to a blue because the cornea is getting thicker. It's a meniscus lens, meniscus minus lens, thin in the center and thick on the periphery. Now, the relative pachymetry map is different. The relative pachymetry map gives you percentages of how much thicker or thinner the cornea will be in percent compared to what it should be at that point. So this point right here is six tenths of a percent thinner than normal. This point right here is one tenth of a percent thicker. So this is a normal cornea. It's not till it gets up to about 5% that these values are a problem. But anyway, the relative pachymetry map gives you a percentage of how much above or below normal it would be at that specific point. So we'll see that's helpful for us when we're looking at areas of the cone. Now, the elevation map, which is shown here, has a front and a back, okay? Now, again, like I argue with Steve Kleiss, I argue with Michael Bellin because he wants to use a sphere as a reference. And I said, the reference should be what's normal, not a sphere. The cornea is not spherical. It's a prolate ellipsoid. It looks like the nose of a rocket ship. The cornea is steepest in the center and the radius gets flatter as we move out. It's a prolate ellipsoid. So 
as we said, that normal Q value is minus 26, so we can make a normal ellipsoid with a standard Q value and use that as the reference. If you use a sphere, the cornea is always above the sphere in the center, and it's always below the sphere in the periphery because it's a prolate ellipsoid. So we use the prolate ellipsoid as the reference. And what you see here is values are green. They're all zero, a few microns up or above or below uh, is normal. And then the same thing on the posterior surface. We use the normal asphericity, the normal curvature, and it's a prolate ellipsoid. And once again, we get values that are normal so that there's zero on most individuals and only if you have an abnormality do you get an elevation above. The other thing that we do is we make it a toric ellipsoid, not a sphere, so that astigmatism doesn't show up as this band going across the cornea. The band goes away if you take into account a toric prolate ellipsoid. So this is how we have the six maps arranged. Now page two of the report looks like this. The first thing we have is the EKR65 versus the pupil size. And we use 4.5 millimeters. Now, people say, well, gee, the standard keratometer measures three millimeters, and the IOL master measures two and a half, and the lens star measures two. Why would you use four and a half millimeters? Because it's a zone. And now let me explain that. All right. So, the normal pupil size for a 70 year old person in a refracting lane that's in mesopic conditions is four and a half millimeters. That's the average pupil size of your cataract patient when you set them in a lane and have the light stem down to low for measuring their visual acuity. So when we determine the power of that cornea, we do it over the four and a half millimeter zone and use 40,000 points on the front and the back surface of the cornea and then calculate the best fit toric ellipsoid to tell us the power of that zone that best represents its refractive power as a K-reader. Now, the masters, the old keratometer masters like Jabal and those guys, Germans, they were all pretty smart. Jabal wasn't, but they were all pretty smart guys. And they said, well, gee, if we take a ring measurement, what should be the size of the ring? If we could take one ring and weren't looking at 40,000 points, but we were only looking at two, what would be the best diameter ring to use? And the answer is 3.2 millimeters. They made the keratometer 3.2 because the area inside 3.2 and the area outside 3.2 for a four and a half millimeter pupil are equal. They're both 50%. So that's why they chose 3.2. Now, when they went down to two and a half and two, well, not that ring now is not even uh, split the areas in half. It's more weighted toward the center. And the result is that it's closer to that apex. And so you get a higher power. In fact, that's the reason why A constants had to change back in the late 90s is because when we went from the manual keratometer at 3.2 to the IOL master at 2.5, the difference in the corneal power was three tenths of a diopter stronger. And that three tenths of a diopter stronger is why all the A constant change in the late 90s didn't have anything to do with going from immersion A scan to optical biometry axial length because Wolfgang Haggis calibrated to immersion A scan. Those are, if you take 100 patients, you get the same thing with immersion A scan as you get with the optical biometer. Now you get a difference on an individual, but you don't get a difference uh, for uh, a large study of patients. So that's the reason why we uh, end up uh, between 
basically changing the A constant is because. So what I tried to explain is the four and a half millimeter pupil size determines it for the zone and would be equivalent to a 3.2 millimeter ring of keratometry that split the areas in and outside the circle equally. And that's why those uh, 3.2. So the four and a half millimeter zone still has the best correlation with keratometric measurements because it does the zone and comes up with that. Now the EKR value 65 will be different because as I said, it reflects the back surface power. Now, uh, angle kappa, okay. Now there's a question then, and it goes back to this chord mu and angle kappa. And uh, to just to make that quick, we don't measure angles in ophthalmology. Okay, angle kappa, we measure the cord length between the pupil center and the visual axis. And angles, you have to have a synoptophore. That's the only way you can measure the angular measurements in an eye is with a synoptophore. You have the patient look at some and then look at something else and you measure the angle that they go through. We don't measure angles. We measure the distance between two points and then use a formula to convert from that cord to an angle. So uh, Daniel Chang and George Waring the fourth wrote an article on cord mu, and basically cord mu is that distance from the light reflex to the center of the pupil. So you never measure an angle. You always are using cord mu, and so we never do use angle kappa. It's a theoretical measurement that you can measure on a synoptophore, but cord mu is the measurement that is reported on all of the optical biometers and on the pentacan. So that's where that uh, that's where that comes from. Okay, so back to this. The four and a half millimeter pupil size is used on the EKR65 with 40,000 points, and it comes up with the best power of the cornea with 40,000 points reflecting both the back and the front surface power in both astigmatism and refractive power. Now, that blue curve that you see right here is the EKR65, and this is a normal patient. And what we see is that the power of the cornea, if this is the dead center, the one millimeter zone, begins to slightly increase as we go out by about a diopter and a quarter when we get out to about this. So the normal cornea has about a diopter and a quarter, a diopter and a half, of spherical aberration. The power of the cornea actually increases by about a doctor and a quarter in the normal individual from the center to the periphery. And that's why an aspheric lens that's minus 0.27 changes about minus one and a quarter doctors from the center to the periphery and cancels that out. So a spherical aberration of plus 0.27 in the cornea is about a diopter and a quarter of increase in power out to a six millimeter diameter and an interocular lens that's minus 27 will have a, a reduction in power from the center to the periphery. So now uh, I had a question, what's the EKR65 stand for? Well, the EKR65, EKR stands for equivalent power because in the normal cornea, if we got a K reading of 45, and it's a normal cornea that's 82.2% from the back to the front ratio, the asphericity is the same and everything's right, well, we want to get 45 diopters. So what we do is you'll see that we only reflect the difference in the back surface power from the front so that we can say, a 45 diopter cornea that's normal in every way will still be reported as 45 diopters, and it's only if its back surface power is abnormal that that K value will change. And the EKR65 we're going to talk about now. The EKR65 65 has to do with this. Now, this is a normal cornea that we see here, and look what we have. It says we have a peak at 46, 
We have a peak at 43 and a half, and we have power in between. So this is a histogram of the distribution of the power over this six millimeter, or in this case, the four and a half millimeter zone. So this is a distribution of the powers in the four and a half millimeter zone in a histogram in terms of frequency. So we've got a lot of 43 and a halves, a lot of 46, and a little bit of the average in between. And that's what this is showing. We've got a lot of stronger power in this peak. We've got some flatter power, which is another peak. And then in between, we've got these other powers, and this is a histogram of that. The EKR65 uses a software that goes in and figures out from studies that I've done over the years that the best refracting power in terms of the astigmatism and the refracting power that you can represent. And we'll see when we look into keratoconus patient in a second that the average is not always the right value. We'll see in a minute that that's not true, and I'll show you why. So uh, here, the IKR is just a graphic display of these powers, and this is a histogram of how the powers are actually distributed on this graph. Okay. IOL power calculations. Now, this is what I was leading up to. The Pentacam measures the front and the back surface, and the EKR65 doesn't take the average of all the powers. And I'll show you why in just a second. But it's not net power. Net power of the cornea is about a diopter less than the keratometric value. And what we wanted to do is not have to go out and change every K reading, uh, every lens constant, by reporting the net true net power of the cornea. In fact, every IOL power formula available today does that conversion from keratometric power to net power as the first step. Binkhorst did that. It's about a diopter less. Binkhorst, Olson, uh, Barrett, Holiday, every single one of us make that conversion as the very first step from keratometric power to net power. So. We don't want to report a net power, otherwise the interocular lens power formulas would end up double compensating. So we want a K reading that comes out the same on a normal individual. So here's what I'm saying. The keratometry, but adjust for the back surface power from normal. So if we had a cornea with a radius of 7.5 and the cornea on keratometry measured 45, if that back surface power were normal, then we'd report 45 diopters. But if the back surface power was three tenths of a diopter stronger than normal, then we'd subtract that three tenths of a diopter and report 44.7. The net power is 43.3. So the easy way to say that is the EKR value reports the value that takes into account the back surface power difference from normal. In fact, the IOL master total K does the same thing. They report the same way. Now, when we look at these first, and we're gonna talk just a little bit more about what that 65 means in a minute, but here's our first patient. Now let's take a look at this. All right, now, the first thing you notice is Look at these semi-meridians. They're all over the place. And the fact is that because they're like this, there's no way you're ever going to come up with a toric lens axis as the right position of placement because there is no right axis. There may be an optimal place, but you can't find that looking at keratometry, okay? Because it's very, very irregular. So the first thing you should look at when you look at these axial power maps is the regularity of the semi-meridians on the axial map. Now, it turns out that the tangential map often has irregularity, but it's very rare on the axial map. All right, now, now let's look at this for just a second. Now, this is a, uh, is a, uh, an eye 
that is from a moderate keratoconic patient. Now look what we have. Here's the hot spot. We notice that the power actually instead of what we saw before where we had this thing where it gradually increases is maximum in the center in the one millimeter zone and then begins to go down. But more importantly, we see two peaks. We see a peak here at about 40, which is this peak that you see right here, right there, and that's these paracentral power. And then we also see a hot spot peak that is right here, and that's this one. So we have a pair of 44.5 peak and a 40 peak, okay? And that's what happens in keratoconus. And uh, the power of the peak is what a keratometer measures. And the reason is that little bump gets a reflection that's convex, and so it always measures the peak. So it's going to give you a K reading of about 45 right here. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to say if I had a bifocal IOL, that had a power that was five diopters in a small zone in the middle and Plano in the remainder of that lens, I will tell you right now that like a bifocal interocular lens, you don't look through the average power, you look through the paracentral power for distance and you look through the add power for near. And the keratoconic cornea is exactly like a contact lens or an interocular lens that's refractive with a cap on it that has a plus five diopter power or whatever the keratoconic power is. And what you'll find is that a, um, a patient with keratoconus mild like this one with that five diopter cap will be able to hold a uh, J1 plus print at about 10 to 15 to 20 centimeters in front of the eye and read down to the smallest line you can show them because they've got a bifocal cap in the cornea. They don't look through that cap for distance. They look through the paracentral area and that's where the EKR 65. It actually, they don't look to just this peak because it's gradual out here. And the EKR 65, after looking at a lot of patients with cones, irregular corneas, refractive surgery, that EKR 65 gives you the best power. And what you see here is, look, the EKR 65 mean is 42 and a half. It's down here. Whereas that peak power that you get from the keratometer will be 45 diopter. And so... Uh, that's what we end up with with the EKR 65. That 65 means we don't take the average. We actually look at the 65% maximum power for distance, and that's where it comes up. Now, we just had a question, and that question was, well, I said that the uh, cornea was prolate. Why, if it's prolate? Uh, does the power of the cornea increase further out? And that's a tricky question because here's what happened. And let me see if I can explain. The cornea is prolate for absolutely sure. It's steeper in the center, steeper radius, and gets flatter in the periphery, okay? But that Q value is minus 26. In order to be prolate enough to have no spherical aberration and no increase in power, the Q value would have to be minus 54. And so it's about halfway between. So even though the cornea gets flatter as we move from the center, it doesn't get flat enough. It's about halfway between the perfect ellipsoid and a sphere so it still has about half the spherical aberration that you would get from the perfect ellipsoid. So the perfect ellipsoid at minus 52 would be zero. The normal cornea is one and a quarter spherical aberration, and a sphere would actually have two and a half diopters of spherical aberration. So the cornea is still prolate, steepest at the center, but it still has about half the spherical aberration of a sphere, so that's what it goes up to one and a quarter. All right, now, 
what I just went through that showed you how the EKR65 works, works well for all of these things, post-refractive, post-PKP, keratoconus, corneal scar, any cause of irregular astigmatism, those 40,000 points that we measure on the front and the back surface are going to allow me to come up with a keratometric equivalent that will be the best value that you can do on an IOL power calculation. Now, when I show you that, I have to show you this picture at the same time. This is a normal cornea, a LASIK, and an RK. In the normal cornea, look at that peak. There's only a three diopter range. And the cornea, as I said, goes up about a diopter and a quarter out to six millimeters. A LASIK patient is flattest in the center and goes up much more rapidly because we flatten more in the center than we do in the periphery and we get this. An RK patient does this, but the big point is there's a 13 diopter spread in an RK, a five diopter in a LASIK, and only three in a normal. So the point is that the bigger the spread, the higher the range, the more difficult it is to come up with the perfect power. So in RK patients, we're not going to get the same precision as we get in the LASIK, and we're not going to get the same precision in a LASIK that we get in a normal because the irregularity in the cornea makes the precision with which we can measure much less. All right. So the EKR65 works for all of those irregularity conditions that I just showed you. The four and a half millimeter zone is the one that's equivalent to the mesopic pupil of most patients, but there are patients that have been on myotics that have abnormally small pupils for whatever reason. So if you see a patient that's in the refracting lane in mesopic conditions and their pupils only three millimeters, well then yes, you want to go down to that three millimeter zone because their pupils three millimeters in dim light. Okay, but the normal person is four and a half. That's why we use that value as the recommended. Now, thinning disorders. Okay, when we were looking at thinning disorders, remember I said the normal vertical location down is about minus 19. And I said, if that pachymetry min is inferior by more than 0.61 diopters, that's probably the most uh, important indicator of keratoconus of anything we look at. Now we're gonna see hot spots on the topography and hot spots on the relative pachymetry and hot spots on the elevation maps, but this value right here is the one that is probably the most critical. All right, so let's take a look at a patient here. All right, well, the first thing we do is we take a look at a couple of things. You notice that the RMS value up here is 413. We said the normal was 37. Not too bad, but a little higher than normal. We also see that actually the Myers here uh, are pretty good on the axial map, but we notice that on the tangential map that they're pretty irregular. We got this little hot spot that shows up in orange here. And we notice that it's inferiorly displaced. And we look up here and we see it's 0.9 millimeter. Well, that's bigger than 0.61. We look down here, not much. 1.3%, 2% around that 2.1 in that area. We look over here on the elevation map, green. 2.33 microns. We look over here and we see a five micron and it's yellow, but it's not red. So the only thing that was really suggestive that this would be a cone is this inferior displacement because all the rest of these are just suspicious. If that were not down here and was up there, I'd say that wasn't keratoconus. Now this is the left eye and there's the right eye. It's always asymmetric keratoconus. It's never the same in each eye. But now look at the right eye. 
hot spots, decentered zone, very thin, 8% red spot here, red spot there, and a red spot here. Now, that posterior elevation, the back elevation, is always more important in keratoconus because even though there's a nipple on the cornea, the upper lid goes across that bump and flattens it out so the normal four to six epithelial cells that are four to six microns thick for a thickness of about 50 microns of the normal epithelium ends up rubbing those epithelial cells so that you end up at set of six with two or three. And it reduces the height of the cone on the front surface. Well, that can't happen on the back. So here you see 52 versus 25. Well, 25, that's three epithelial cells difference. And that's a result of that upper lid moving across that. So you always look at the posterior float, not the front, because the epithelium always gets rubbed off of that front surface and it's just never as high as the back. So this was clearly a case of keratoconus, but that inferior uh, displacement was a critical factor on the one that was marginal. Now, when we look here, again, recognition, all right? We got a crab. We got a crab here. We've got a thin spot right down here. So this is not only elevated, but it's thin right here. Well, this is pollution marginal degeneration. And what you see here is that that's elevated dramatically on the front and the back surface here. So this is a classic picture of a pollution marginal degeneration. And again, it's got an elevation and thinning in the area down here at six. It's got the relative pachymetry, which shows how thin this is. And you see how elevated it is so this is the classic uh, pollution marginal degeneration picture. All right, and let's see here. Here's the other eye. That was the right eye. This is the left eye, and you see how severe that was. Uh, and again, we see the thinning below, the elevation, a little bit on one side here, the elevations that we have and this relative thinning area that's down here at the bottom of the cornea. All right, another case. We look here, we see the Myers are distorted on both maps, so this guy's got a regular astigmatism. We notice that there's some steepening above up here, doesn't mean much. We look here and we see that the cornea is extremely thin in the center. It's actually 25.6% thinner than normal in this central area. But we look over here at the elevation map and we see it's minus five, so that's nothing. And right here it's plus two, so it's not elevated. So this is the typical post-LASIK picture where the cornea has been thinned down to a point of 395 microns in the center, okay? But no elevation posteriorly, so we're not worried about it. Here's the other eye, a little steepening here, 35% thinner, 334, not bad here, but look at the poster, 14 microns elevated. This is ectasia. So this is an example of a patient with ectasia that uh, is a result of that posterior elevation coming forward. So what we've tried to do this evening over the last 55 minutes is show you the way to look at these holiday report. Very quickly, the color codes make it simple to recognize things. That interpretation guideline, I've spent a lot of time going through the details that we've discussed tonight. And it's got all of the things that we've talked about and more. So I would certainly recommend that you download that uh, so that you can see all of the things that we've talked about tonight. But my hope is we've been able to uh, give you 
the information you need to quickly and efficiently take care of your patients in the best way so you can get the best interocular lens power calculations from the EKR 65 corneal measurements and pick up patients with abnormalities ahead of time by just looking at those maps and then looking at those higher order aberrations over the six millimeter zone to determine whether multifocal lenses are appropriate for your patient. So thank you so much for your attention during these difficult, difficult times. So that's it, Michelle. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Holliday, and thank you everyone for attending. Just a reminder, on your GoToWebinar screen, there is a text box where you can enter any questions you may have. If you enter them now, I will be able to read them off to Dr. Holliday. If you missed part of the web webinar or if there's anything you would like to go back and review, you will receive a link to the recording within a few days. All right, Dr. Holliday, we do have a couple questions. Sure. How does the treatment of pellucid marginal degeneration uh, differ from keratoconus? Mm, boy, isn't that, <laughs> well, that that's uh, an excellent question. Um, well, with pellucid, in terms of the treatment, the thinning that we have, and let me back up to that slide and show you the problem here. Um, on that patient that we had, this one right here. Well. The difficulty is that this is your thin spot, okay? So in pellucid, this thin spot down at the bottom, you can't do a corneal transplant there and replace that tissue, you can, but the problem is you're right up against vascularized sclera, and the result is your rejection rate goes way up. So uh, at this point, the, the goal is to try and uh, to support and to create more strength in this area. So the one thing that you would do in this is you would go ahead and you can do a uh, cross linking at this point to try to strengthen that point. And if lamellars don't work well, because you put a lamellar across that, you still haven't increased the strength much, even when you suture here and here. So cross linking is the first choice. But grafts, the point is that when you put grafts in that have, uh, full thickness, then the problem with that is you have a rejection rate. So you can only use lamellars or cross-linking to help stabilize this area. Where with, with keratoconus, that's not true. In keratoconus, see, we can come out and we can actually take out this thin zone and do a, a graph on that, put the graph in, and it would uh, uh, help. Now, Again, the first step is always the cross-linking because it's non-invasive, you're not doing, you don't have to deal with rejections uh, and preserving the uh, endothelium is a good idea. But partial thickness grafts and keratoconus don't work well because you don't get the strength that you need. So we end up doing full thickness grafts and those in my hands over the years work great. Uh, but in pellucid, it's a whole different story and you can't get out to the periphery with the graph without running into rejection problems. Next question, Michelle. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have, with a borderline cornu, will you choose a segmented IOL like the ones from, let's say, uh, Oculentis or Symphony IOL? Another good question. So, uh, by the way, look at the RMS value in this patient, 3.344. So clearly in this eye, even a monofocal lens is not going to provide good vision in this patient because that's three times the one micron. But the, uh, the statement is, is absolutely true. And, and here's the way I think of it now. Non-aspheric, that is, spherical IOLs are gone. There's no manufacturer that actually makes uh, any significant number of spherical lenses. They're all aspheric because they're better. They provide better vision, better contrast sensitivity, because the cornea has got spherical aberration. So uh, the way I look at those is like this. We have an aspheric monofocal lens. Then we have a lens like 
the symphony, which is still a bifocal uh, diffractive multifocal IOL or bifocal IOL at 175. And then we have in, but it only has nine rings. And then we have uh, bifocal multifocal IOLs that have two and a quarter, two and a half, all the way up to four. And now we have trifocal uh, multifocal IOLs that uh, end up with uh, powers of about one and a quarter and 250, which are what patients in, in the Western Hemisphere prefer. And the way I look at those, it's a spectrum, all right? That the aspheric monofocal is not going to add any higher order aberrations or forward light scatter or halos and glare to the system at all. The symphony will add about half as much as a trifocal or bifocal multifocal interocular lens. So the answer to that question is yes. In a patient that's marginal, that has just a little bit, say 0.5 microns of higher order aberration, not near the one, but down just over the, the half mark, basically. Well, those patients, if they're subjectively good, uh, are possibly good candidates for something like the symphony if they have the right psychological profile. They have to be someone who doesn't want glasses. They have to be someone who tolerates halos and glare. And if they have a very high contrast personality that says, no, I don't want the halos or glare, then I would be very reluctant to even put a symphony in somebody that's marginal because the patient's response subjectively is just as important as the optical performance. So that's the way that works. You have to take the patient's uh, profile and put them into that spectrum. And yes, there are some people that are absolutely not good candidates because they have over one micron of RMS error and uh, they're not going to see well at all. And so those people I would, but in those people that are marginal, you take into account the optics at a half a micron and you take into account their personality and then you come up with the right decision. The one other thing that I did mention is that IC8 that AccuFocus has, that's a pinhole, uh, provides an intermediate vision, not near, but intermediate, and reduces those higher order aberrations. So that's going to turn out to be, and Argawal has shown that with the, uh, that small pupil, pupil opacity where he makes a pinhole pupil, that IC8 is ideal for people with higher order aberrations that are not even good candidates for an aspheric IOL because it actually reduces their aberrations and you can take people that are best corrected to 2040, 2050, 2060 as their best corrected vision and bring them down to 2025 with that IC8 AccuFocus pinhole. Other questions? Thank you. Let's see. Uh, can the EKR values be used in new generation formulas such as the Barrett or the Haggis? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, yes, that's that's the whole point. Uh, some the uh, EKR 65 is basically the equivalent of the total keratometry, the TK on the IOL master, because it reflects the back surface power. And it reports the value that is equivalent to the K reading that would work best in that patient. So it doesn't re require a different A constant or anything. So the studies that show for the Olson and the Barrett and the Holiday 2 were that TK value with the back surface astigmatism and uh, total power uh, do better because what it doesn't help the majority of the patients. It's the same because their back surface power is normal. What it does is it makes those patients that were outliers due to their back surface power, patients that we now make an adjustment that the K reading will come out right for the IOL power. So absolutely, the EKR65 is actually 
a step ahead of keratometric values that only use front surface power. Thank you. How does one use data from the EKR map in different IOL power formula formulae in case in case of one post keratofractive surgery or two keratoconus? Well, that's the nice thing about the EKR 65. You don't need to do anything but use the values that are in that middle upper panel and those values for both the axis and the power are all you need. The only time that you make a change in what that is, is if the uh, pupil is smaller than normal. And that's the only time. In other words, when you look at this right here, this one in gray is always the best, unless you have a pupil size that's three millimeters. And if you do, then these values would be better. So you never have to do anything other than look at the patient's pupil in mesopic conditions. If it's normal, then you use these values. And if it's not normal, if it's smaller, then I would use these. Above four and a half, I wouldn't worry about those too much because you have the Siles Crawford effect. And the Siles Crawford effect basically minimizes the effect of rays as you get out to five and six millimeters. So the only adjustment that you have to make as a surgeon is if they have a smaller than normal pupil, then you go down one or two boxes and use these values and the other. But otherwise, all of the rest of this information is just done for you to look at it, but it's already done all the software computations that you can't do in your head anyway with 30 or 40,000 points. So use these values unless the pupil is smaller than normal. Thank you. What other parameters uh, do you look at besides the RMS HOA for the tri for trifocal IOLs? The uh, cord mu. That cord mu value is the are the only two things that you need to look at. Uh, and again, if it's greater than 0.42, uh, that's all you, you need to worry about. So the RMS value of the HOA and the uh, cord mu are the only two values that you need to worry about. So let me go back to where those were. Uh, when you look at those, yeah, right here. Okay, so those are the only things that really, uh, really make any difference because, let me back up, yeah, right here. Okay, so that cord mu is the one thing that you have to look at. And the other thing that you have to look at is this RMS value. This one tells you if that distance is too great that a diffractive multifocal is not going to work. And uh, because the uh, quality of the cornea is not good enough, right? Well, this is the cord mu, which is fine here. And then that um, value for the RMS error is the other one. So those are the two values that you need to look at. The RMS value tells you the quality of the cornea and the cord mu tells you that separation that if it's greater than 0.42, then you can't center the multifocal lens properly. If you put it on the visual axis, it's not concentric with the pupil. And if you put it over in the pupil, it's not near the visual axis. So that's where that comes into play. The goal is a multifocal lens, the diffractive ring should be concentric with the pupil and be on the visual axis. Well, you can't do that because only a very few patients have a cord mu of zero. They're one in a hundred. And so what those numbers do is when they cord mu gets further apart, then the performance of the multifocal lens drops down because it can't be concentric with the pupil and be on the visual axis both. So halfway between is the best place you can put that. 
And when that's over 0.42 millimeters on the Pentacam, then that difference is too great, so you don't get good optical performance. Is the goal for post-op spherical aberration still negative 0.12 microns? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the goal, well, that's a good point. The goal is, is this, I would say, all right? If you have 0.27 microns of spherical aberrations in the cornea and 0.27 in the lens and have zero, then your distance vision can be as good as 2010, and you'll have perfect vision. Now, when the pupil, when you look up close and the pupil constricts, that power is going to be the same as it was for distance. So if you were plain O for distance, you're going to be plain O for near with that interocular lens. Now, if you have a little negative spherical aberration, the studies have shown that you can have up to about three tenths of a micron of negative spherical ocular aberration before it affects the distance visual acuity. Minus three tenths, so it's a little more than the value that the person asking the question had. You could be up to about minus three tenths. Now, with that minus three tenths, you're going to have more power in the center of the cornea or in the center of the optical system. So when the person looks up close and they get a, a constriction of the pupil, they're going to see about a one line improvement in vision. Now, the proof of that, there's two. One is anybody that's ever done hyperopic LASIK or PRK knows that those patients end up with better near vision, and it's because they end up with a hyperprolate cornea, and that's what, and they have negative spherical aberration. And patients in which the uh, technus lens was used that ended up with negative three tenths of spherical aberration ended up with about a half to one line better near acuity than those people that were zero. So. I would say the answer to that question is yes. Uh, an eighth up to two tenths, three tenths of a micron of negative spherical aberration will give the patients a little bit better near vision. Now, there's no lens available that's over minus two seven, so you're never going to get uh, that much because patients have about plus nobody has 0.4 or, or, or has negative spherical aberration in their cornea, so you're never going to end up with anybody that has uh, that much negative spherical aberration with a normal cornea and a normal uh, aspheric interocular lens. All right, please correct me if I mispronounce this, but do we need to apply the Wong Coke adjustment if we use the EKR65 for IOL calculations? Definitely. And in fact, uh, in fact, there's a newer nonlinear regression that I published with Lee Wang and Doug uh, about a year ago that's a nonlinear regression that's even more accurate. The Wang Coke uh, overcompensates a little bit. So you end up with a myopic, and let me back up. With longer axial lengths, the uh, measured on an optical biometer, what Doug discovered is that those lengths are too long. And what happened is when Wolfgang was, Hygus was calibrating the device, he didn't have eyes over 26 millimeters long, and so he just extrapolated that with a straight line. And it turns out that's not straight. It turns out that the eyes with optical biometry are measured too long relative to immersion A scan. So the result is we make hyperopic surprises because we get axial lengths that are measured over 26 millimeters or actually longer than they should be. So what, what Doug and Lee did is they came up with a regression that compensated for that. But when they did that, they didn't use the, uh, on their first article, they didn't use the 
uh, ULIB lens constants. They used the manufacturers and overcompensated a little bit. And then they came back and did the constants and backed off. But during that same time, I went through and did it for the holiday one and holiday two uh, with a nonlinear regression. And that was done about a year, maybe two years ago in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. And Lee published that along with Doug and I. And it has the actual uh, nonlinear adjustments because it's not a straight line. And that nonlinear adjustment should be used, yes, with every K reading that you take, because it doesn't have anything to do with the accuracy of the K reading. It has to do with the accuracy of the axial length measurement, and those are wrong on optical biometry on every single instrument out there. And you have to compensate for that uh, because it measures them too long. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Holliday. That is all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for everyone in attendance and who sent in questions. Thank you, Dr. Holliday, for your excellent presentation and your added discussion at the end. Thanks so much for being here, and I wish all of you to be safe and be healthy. Thank you. This concludes the presentation. On behalf of Oculus, we wish you all a good night.